Hello and welcome to my camper van Q&A video. But before we start, an announcement. On Saturday the 18th and Sunday the 19th of September, there are two camper vanning shows being held at the um, race course at Stratford-on-Avon. It's the Adventure Overland Show and the International Camper Van Show. And it, it's kind of two, but they're all merged into one event, effectively. One ticket gets you into both shows. And the Overland Show is by and large more aimed at big, chunky 4x4 vehicles, and the Camper Van Show is aimed at more traditional camper vans, but there is obviously some crossover between them. Either way, it looks like a very, very interesting show, and I've been meaning to go for it for a good couple of years, and finally this year I am going to it. As I say, it's the 18th and 19th of September, and what is more, I've got myself wangled my way into a little section that they're putting together of YouTubers and Instagrammers who have camper vans, and there's a separate little area for us. Um, so if you'd like to come along and say hello, I will be there in my van and would be delighted to uh, say hi and, and have a chat about camper vans or anything like that. Now, I will also want to go off wandering around the show myself. So if you happen to turn up to the YouTuber's spot and see my van and I'm not there, that's because I've gone off for a good look round. Uh, but I will also try to spend a reasonable chunk of my time um, in the van. Obviously, depending on weather, if it's chucking with rain, I'll probably stay in the van the whole time. Who knows? But it would be wonderful to see you there. I've put a link to the show page in the description below, along with a 10% off code that you type in on checkout. The tickets aren't actually that expensive anyway, uh, but 10% off if you want it with the code in the description. That is the 18th and 19th of September at Stratford Racecourse. Looks like it should be a really, really good show. Having a look at um, videos that have been done on previous events, just so much variety, so many interesting vans. This is not like your standard camper van show. Right, enough of that. Let's get on with what this video is all about, which is the Q&A. <laughs> I recently put up, I think it was only about a week ago, a video saying, hey, I've reached 40,000 subscribers. Let's do a Q&A. Do you have any questions? And I pulled the video after just one day because even with just 24 hours, I had enough questions to fill 11 pages of a Word document. And that was after I sort of put similar questions all together, 11 pages. So I suspect this might be part one of a two part Q&A video because I've got so much to get through. And if you haven't already, so I'm just getting my iPad ready, if you haven't already got yourself a large cup of tea, arguably a flask of tea and a good solid pack of digestives, I think you're going to need fortifications because this is going to be a long one. So settle back and let's get into the questions. I've divided these into sections and I will put um, chapter markers in the video description. So if you just want to skip ahead to different sections, you should be able to click on the links and YouTube will skip you forward to wherever um, that particular section is all about. Let's start off with questions about uh, campsites in the UK and uh, various people saying uh, they'd like to hear how do campgrounds work in, in the UK? This is obviously for viewers overseas. How do you find them? What reservations do you need? Are there limits on how long you can stay? What kind of features do they have? and so on. I'll start with the issue of reservations and I would certainly suggest it is a good idea to book in advance. You certainly could just turn up and see if somewhere has a space for you but if you haven't then you'll have to drive on somewhere else. So all the campsites by and large have some mechanism for booking ahead. If you are a member of one of the big camping and caravanning owners clubs, so there's the Caravan and Camping Club and the Motorhome and Caravan... No, I've got those names wrong. I can never remember them for some reason. There's two big clubs, of which I am a member of both, but I can still not remember their names. They have their own websites and apps, which you can search for location and see where the sites are and book them through the website or app. Now, I've always found them a bit clunky. Never really got on with those. I prefer to use a third-party website called PitchUp, Dot com, which has loads of independent campsites listed on it. And you can tell it whether you're in a motorhome or a camper van or a tent and how many people there are, what your dates are, where you want to be, all those kind of parameters. And it will give you a whole long list that you can then pick the one you like the look of, book it through Pitch Up, and it sends you a confirmation email and everything's just taken care of. It's worked very efficiently the times I have tried it. Now, in terms of facilities, well, the club pitches will tend to be pretty much well equipped with showers and toilets and 
grey water and black water emptying, all that kind of stuff. Although having said that, I did once stay on a club site which didn't have any showers. It was made clear, uh, and I had to kind of pick that one because it was near where I wanted to be, but it was slightly odd, I found, that there was a club site with no showers. But by and large, they will have all the basic facilities. If you go to uh, any sort of just random campsite, it, it could be anything. It could be a farmer's field. There could be a tap. There could be showers. There could be toilets. I, I've seen one advertised where the farmer had converted a horse box into the shower facility. I think it had they managed to squeeze two showers into that somehow. And some of them have all kinds of things, you know, little cafes on site. And so the range of facilities varies immensely and it'll be a case of you picking the one you like the look of. They're all listed on the website what the facilities are and people can leave reviews and things so you can choose what you like the look of. In terms of how long you can stay I think most campsites will try to move you on after a set period maybe two or three weeks. I'm not sure if that's legally enforced or if it's just the campsite's own preference. If you stay too long I suspect the campsites run into an issue where you begin to be regarded as residential rather than touring. And once you're doing that, there's the question of whether you should start paying council tax like people in the local houses do. So for that reason, the campsites tend to want to move you on and only have people who are genuinely touring. Um, and in terms of friendliness of the sites, by and large, most campervanners, I think, will well, at least say hello and good morning. And if you want to socialise with them a bit more, certainly there is a, a degree of camaraderie. Um, so, yeah, I'd say it's social. It's a bit like having a boat. You go anywhere in your narrow boat and other boaters will talk to you. you go anywhere in your campervan. If you want to chat to other campervanners, they will generally be social. I mean, occasionally some people won't want to chat. That's fine. You just move on. And uh, don't bother them. That's that's their choice. Or it could be your choice if you're not a sociable person. But yes, I think most people out in their van are happy to have a little chat and, and be nice. So, yeah, it's very pleasant. People are saying, is it hard to book now that demand for campsites has skyrocketed? And am I a member of the various caravan clubs? I think it's always busy this time of year. But I haven't had a problem booking somewhere for the places I've needed to go so far. Now, I haven't used the van hugely, hugely. I did want to, but just circumstances, life, things. Um, but I have been out on a few trips, mainly to go out filming for my Cruising the Cut channel. I've used the van as my base and I haven't had a problem. But I have seen when booking that some types of pitches are fully booked. So if you wanted one with electric, for example, maybe they'd run out of those pitches and I could only get a grassy one. Well, that's fine because I've got the solar panels. So <clears throat> I'd say it's busy, but not impossible to find somewhere. Have you ever wild camped? How do you find camping spots, campgrounds? I, I haven't done a lot of it. It's quite hard to wild camp in England. It is better in Wales and better in Scotland, but England generally is quite anti camper van and motorhome unless you are a responsible citizen and go to a campsite and line up with everybody else in a nice regimented order. Wild camping, ooh, you must be a dodgy character if you're trying to do that. That's the general vibe you get in England and that comes down from not just the, the government but local authorities. A lot of them just don't like um, anybody moving about and sleeping in a van for reasons that we'll probably come on to on a later question. So in terms of wild camping, I stayed in a car park in Wales one night. I've stayed on the road. I did a video about my trip down to Deal, which is probably a couple of years ago now. It was pre-Covid. I think it was the Christmas just before Covid hit, actually. Uh, and I stayed in the van on the road there. But I haven't done a great deal of it. As I say, it is a bit tricky in England, though it can be done. There are places you can find. Another question from the United States. Uh, camping in the US often means parking with lots of trees between spots or lots of space in the treeless parts of the country, not parking lots, which is what I see when I watch various van vlogs in the UK. Is that due to the different geography? Yes, we are a tiny country, really, really, really tiny. And there is not a lot of space. And so everything has to be quite crammed in. I believe there is a legal restriction that says there must be six metres between um, motorhomes or camping plots 
in the UK. I don't know if that is actually legal or just one that they adhere to. It's something to do with fire risk, which is odd because in the narrow boating world, you have the boats lined up next to each other and they've got the same gas cylinders. But anyway, by the by, so there just isn't the space to have vast tracts of grass between camping spots. Anyone with a field has, has paid a lot of money for that field. Land is expensive. Um, so if they want to recoup their money, they're going to pack in as many vans as they possibly can. And another um, question from the States. They have boondocking and dispersed camping over there where you can camp for up to 14 days for free on government land. Does the UK have anything similar? Oh, oh, I wish. No. In fact, the closest similar thing would be on the narrow boat, where on the canals you can moor your boat for up to 14 days at pretty much anywhere on the canals. But on land in a motorhome, government campsites? No. The government does not like people in motorhomes, as I've already mentioned. It doesn't like people travelling around and sleeping in their vans. Neither do the local authorities. The, the, I, to the best of my knowledge, there aren't government campgrounds. Now, there are things like national forests and tracts of land that are managed by organisations on behalf of the state, if you like, and some of them may have campgrounds, but not in the same way that you can just go and boondock in some of these places for 14 days uh, like you can in the US. No, if, if you're um, parking up so I nearly said mooring there if you're parking up somewhere you're probably going to pay a fee won't be 14 days for free um, that, that's for sure pretty much um, and the question here what makes you choose a particular site to stay generally because I've been taking the van to do filming for cruising the cut I'm picking on geography. If I need to be in this location, I'll pick the nearest campsite that has showers. Obviously, not having a shower in the van, I do want to be clean when I turn up to do filming with people, so I will always look for a campsite that has um, showers, if I can possibly do. As I say, I did turn up to one um, camper van club. I forget which of the two camper van clubs it was, but one of them didn't have any showers. But um, in that particular incident, it didn't matter too much. Uh, but generally, showers and geography are my main criteria. And uh, from the same questioner, what do you do in the evenings if you're on your own and keep it clean? Well, that rather limits the options, doesn't it? What's a chap to do on a camper van on his own of an evening? Um, I mostly read. I've got a Kindle, which I actually bought for the boat, but it works really well in the van, of course, being so small. And watch YouTube, make a little something to eat. Uh, but largely just, just watch YouTube and stuff. That's, that's the clean version, anyway. I've also been asked, what do I think of the government's new bill that could end van life? I don't do politics on YouTube or Twitter or anything, um, and I'm not going to get into that now. What I think is people should be aware that there is a government bill which is putting restrictions on, on what you can do, and it is incumbent on you, if you have an interest in that, to go and look at the bill and read some intelligent, informed commentary on it by lawyers and people who understand what it actually means. And don't listen to some random bloke off the internet like me starting to have a little rant or whatever about it because I'm uneducated about it. I haven't looked into it fully and I'm not going to make any judgment. Um, even when I do, I'm not going to make it publicly. I, I, I despair slightly of the, the current fad for people getting irate based on what they've read off Twitter or people on YouTube. It's, if you want to be into this subject, go and do some proper research and then make up your own mind. That is, that is my view on the government's bill. If, if it's of interest to you, go and, go and do some research into it. Right, let's turn to another topic. Security. Have you ever felt scared whilst in the van? Do you feel safer in the van versus going to a, a motel or an Airbnb? What do you do about van security when you're inside? I, I wouldn't say I felt scared. I remember, again, going back to that example in Deal, I was parked on the road and I wasn't so much scared for my physical security in a sense, but there were boy racers absolutely herring up and down outside and the whole van was rocking every time they zoomed past. And I did wonder, you know, what happens if one of them crashes into me. So in that sense, I was a bit nervous. Um, but when I stayed, for example, in the car park in Brecon in Wales, 
I, I didn't feel anxious at all. And in terms of security, I just locked the doors. What I did learn very quickly is you don't lock the doors using the key fob, because if you do that, it sets the motion sensors inside the van. And although I draw the curtains, and I think the sensors are... I think they're only in the cab. Anyway, either way, I managed to set the flipping alarm off the first time I did that. I thought, oh, I'll, I'll be secure. Lock. And then, of course, it all kicked off. Um, so now I have a long stick. This is a very useful long stick, just a piece of dowel. And I can reach through from here and poke a button on the dashboard that just locks all the doors, but without setting the motion sensors. So I'm secure inside, but I'm not going to set the alarms off. And that is pretty much what I do. And if you're worried about security in terms of getting hassled and needing to leap into the front seats and drive off, although there is no direct access from here to the front seats, I could, at a pinch, scramble over into the driver's seat if I wanted to, but I wouldn't generally find myself parking in the kind of place that that would happen. I'm, I'm quite cautious with my camping. I have mostly spent my time on campsites of one form or another, whether it's a farmer's field or a, or a club site. Um, so I haven't really had the experience of needing to be scared. Loads of people have asked me about my travel plans. What trips planned, including any long distance ones when restrictions are eased? Europe, the US, the Highlands of Scotland or West Wales. What about coming over to Jersey or circumnavigating the UK? I would love to do a lot of this stuff. I mean, back six years ago when I bought the boat, the plan before the boat was to buy either a, a bigger camper van or um, a motorhome and go off touring around Europe. And for one reason or other, that, that didn't happen. And I would still like to go off. I don't think I've ever been to Italy. And I'd love to go to Italy and go by camper van. That would be great. Or, or even rent a motorhome. But, you know, don't do some sort of touring around there. Bits of France. I mean, France is very welcoming with all its airs and places you can stop. That sounds good. Maybe go a little off the beaten track and go further east. I don't know. There's Yes is the answer. I'd love to go travelling. It's not practical at the moment, obviously, for various uh, pandemic related reasons. And I know you can now travel a bit, but oh, the aggro of test this way and getting a test that way and the rules keep changing all the time anyway. Um, it's not something I, I want to do now, perhaps next year, depending on how things go. Also, I have a, a certain degree of I wouldn't call them family commitments exactly, but um, reasons to be around to assist um, the family with things. Um, so it's helpful for me to be here in order to be around for that kind of thing. And if I disappear off for several months, which is what you'd really want to do, isn't it? If you want to go touring around Italy, you don't want to make it two weeks. You want to have three months or however long you can now stay in Europe for. I think it's 90 days, isn't it? You'd want to do 90 days of going around Italy and 90 days of going around France. And at the moment, um, I don't feel able to disappear off for 90 days at a time. What do you consider when choosing a destination? I touched on this in an earlier chunk of questions. And at the moment, I'm largely using the van as a base for filming for my Cruising the Cup videos. So I'm picking destinations based on the geography of where I'm going to film. I did recently go up to, it was near Doncaster, purely for a weekend away in the van. And I didn't film. I posted some snaps to Instagram, but I, I deliberately didn't film because I wanted to have a weekend in the van as a holiday weekend in the van where I just used it like any ordinary person would use their van and get away for a weekend. And I met up with them, Greg and Lou and John and Mandy and some other lovely van life people as well up there. Brilliant weekend. Um, and that was picked, well, largely on the basis they, they were already up there and said, do you want to come join me? So, yes. Um, but mostly I'm picking places on the basis of filming. Right, let's get into a little retrospective look. I had a lots of questions about this. Did you choose your van randomly or was there a reason for that specific van? And wouldn't it be better if you had a pass through to the front seats? Well, I did not choose the van randomly. If you go back right to video number one, I do a little walk around. It's only about four minutes long, the video, and I explain why I chose this van. Wouldn't it be better if I had a pass through? No, because I want two passenger seats. Sometimes I need to transport two passengers. So a pass through would take out that middle seat. And, oh, excuse me. And 
Uh, so no, it, it wouldn't be better if I had a pass through. If I really needed to in an emergency, I could I could dive through in an athletic Olympic swimmer style from the back to the front. Um, but I don't have any need to do that. So no, I, I need the two passenger seats. Why didn't you get a higher roof van? Ask many people. Does it annoy you not being able to stand? Would you get a low one again? Do you wish you'd gone for a bigger van or a motorhome, perhaps to incorporate a bath or a shower, shower room? What about a pop top? It's tricky this one because the answer is yes and no. I like a compact van. In fact, the first van I was looking to buy was an even smaller van, the Nissan NV200. And this van is the long wheelbase version of the Pro Ace. So not only did I not get the small NV200, I, I bought a bigger van than I was initially imagining. And this is about as big as I like to drive for things like going to the supermarket. Because, and again, viewers overseas may not quite have a handle on this because I imagine your car parking spaces, for example, in America and Australia are vast and the car parks are vast. But in Britain, the car parking spaces in the supermarket are barely as wide as the vehicles. So you can hardly open the door sometimes. It's, it's crazy. And they're not that long and uh, bigger vehicles. You do occasionally see motorhomes in the car park and they have to park over in the far corner because that's the only place they can find a space without other cars. And then they take up two bays. So I like the compact size of the van. If anything, I'd like a smaller van in terms of everyday use. But yes, it is annoying not being able to stand and I would like to have a shower. And if I'd had the money when I was converting it, I would have had a pop top put in. But they're about £4,000 and I did not have another £4,000 on top of the van cost and the conversion costs. I'm toying with it now. And obviously I would have to then take out the roof, take out the vent, take out the lights, take the solar panels off, take out the fan. Um, I'd have to look at my shelving unit, though hopefully I'd be able to put that back when the pop top was on. What else? No, I reckon if I did that, I could take it to a fitters and get a pop top put on. Then I'd have to insulate it, probably put different solar panels on the roof because I don't know if a fiberglass pop top would be able to take the weight of the, the, the full size, um, you know, the self standing ones. I'd probably have to get those flexible ones. Um, yeah, so there'd be some tweaks, but I would like to have um, that. Now, the other thing on the pop top roof is, you know, they, they, they pop higher one end than the other. And I can't decide whether I'd want the higher end this end because it's roughly here where I sit and cook. Or would I want the higher end here? Because this end of the roof is already lower than this end. So if this went up a little bit, that would be fine. But then I could stand here. I don't know. Then I'd quite like one that, that pops up sideways. You don't see those these days, but there used to be a thing on camper vans where it didn't pop up at the front or back. It, it lifted up sideways, in which case I'd have this as the low side, that as the high, no, hang on. Yeah, probably that as the high, I don't know. Thoughts, suggestions welcome in the comments. But I may get a pop top if a pop top, reputable pop top company can be found who would be willing to convert one where the van has already had quite a lot of conversion in it. Um, and back to the original question about would I like a bigger thing? I did a video a while ago at one of the um, motorhome shows. It was two or three years ago now. And in fact, it might have been over on Cruising the Cut. But there was a very compact coach built motorhome that I really liked. It wasn't one of these big ones. It was barely bigger than a van motorhome, but it was a coach built. And I, I it was tiny, but I really liked it. So there's a bit of me that would like one of those as well. Probably for if I went off touring round Europe, then I would like a bigger motorhome. But I like my van. I like my van as well. Hordes of people asking, what would you have done differently with your van or what would you like to change? Well, obviously the, the pop top, as just mentioned, I would like to have a pop top and I wish I'd had the money to have that done right from the outset. Anything different? The trouble... When I look round the van, I think, oh, this doesn't work very well. And I think, but where else could I have put this or whatever? And you think, well, if it had gone there, ah, but it couldn't go there because that would have meant a problem with whatever. For example, 
the propane heater which ended up underneath the um, hob unit was originally going to be at the back of the van but there was a chassis member right underneath where the holes needed to go for the inlet and exhaust so it couldn't go there and then it couldn't go at the back because the spare tire is under there and then it couldn't go on this side because the other chassis member was down this length so it certain things ended up forcing certain bits being put in certain places so although i now look at them and think oh i wish this was here or this was there there was a good reason why everything ended up in the place it was just due to the shape of the van and how i wanted it. i wanted this layout the van has come out in the layout i wanted and because of that not having the traditional rock and roll bed across the, the back but having an l-shaped one and things like that has kind of dictated where other things have come there's little things i'd like to change the master on off switch for the electrics i put underneath one of the seats and it's just a little bit of a faff having to lift up the seat and turn everything on and off there i'd have preferred to have put it as soon as you open the door to that side and it could have gone there because that's the electrics covered so there's some little things i'd like to change and other things possibly but every time i think about it i think well i don't know where else i would have put them so it's hard to say have you gone somewhere in the van and found you've left something important back at the boat no luckily i have in the van gone to the showers and remembered once i got there and was all wet that i had forgotten to bring the towel with me and then had the option of staggering back to the van stark naked or using my dirty clothes as a towel i used the dirty clothes as a towel um although <laughs> I was briefly tempted because I don't think there was anybody much around at the time of the morning where I was. I thought, if I make a run for it and cover my dignity with my hands as far as I can. Anyway, I scrapped that idea and used um, an old T-shirt. Given the choice, with money no object, would you rather buy a new van and build and convert again or buy a ready-to-go camper? If money were an issue, would that change your answer? Mm, I rather fancy doing some more camper van conversions. I'd like to do a smaller van, either an NV200 or even smaller. There's a van that Peugeot Citroen make that is the smaller one than the Berlingo. And I can't remember what it's called. It's tiny. And Roma Home did a conversion on it called the R10. It's literally big enough for one person and you have to sleep with your head on the passenger seat. And I rather fancied having a go at doing a conversion on one of those. I'd quite like to have a go at converting a Berlingo. And I'd quite like a bigger van to have a go at converting. I want an entire car park full of vans that I can have a go at converting because it's just interesting doing the different designs and seeing where you can fit things in. Would I buy a ready-made motorhome? Uh, yes, if my premium bonds came up and I had loads of money. Um, there is a little uh, motorhome. I don't want a big one. I don't want one of these monster things. But there are some very compact little motorhomes that I quite like the look of. Um, so yeah, I, I, I like both. I like both. I like everything. All vans. Top things you'd like to have but don't have for your van. Shower. I would like to have a shower. The shower tent is okay. And I, there were further questions on that later. But it would be nice to have an actual shower i did once try at the campsite which didn't have any showers i tried doing a bed bath i put towels down and then just splashed loads of water over me with a flannel oh my god it went everywhere and it soaked through the towels and made the bedding wet it was a disaster so if i'm going to do that again i need to come up with a better plan i'm wondering vaguely whether if the the bed is out so you've got the full width of the bed to lie on if i bought something like a small plastic children's paddling pool and pop that up and then i could kind of lie in that and do myself a bed bath without the water going everywhere but it would just be easier to have a shower compartment i'm also toying with if i had a pop top is there enough space that i could conceivably hang a shower curtain from the pop top down into a little bucket that i could stand in and do some kind of internal shower that way but I don't know. I have to wait till I've got a pop top. How do you feel your DIY skills have progressed over the years of having to maintain two maintenance hungry vehicles, being the van and the boat? Um, yeah, they have come on a lot. I think building the van made me realise that I could do these kind of things. And OK, it's not exactly artisan craft quality, but everything works. 
Even the gas installation I did myself, and I've had that fully certified and checked over, and that's fine. And the electrics, and yeah, so I'm, I, I feel more confident about doing stuff. Uh, for example, at the time of filming, I've got a brand new solar panel for the boat. Huge thing it is. I want to beef up my solar. And whereas when I first had the solar installed six years ago, I wouldn't have dreamed of drilling holes in the boat roof and tapping the holes to put a thread on them. Now I'm contemplating doing that with this new solar panel rather than paying someone to do it. So I think it's fair to say I feel more confident on the DIY. What is your favourite and least favourite thing about the van? Favourite thing? Um, the whole thing. The fact that I have converted it is um, I still, every time I slide that side door open and get into the van, I'm delighted to say I still get a little tingle of pleasure from the fact that this is my van. I made this van. I'm pleased with myself for this. So just the van having been converted is my favourite thing about it. Least favourite thing about it, uh, lack of pop top, I think, lack of headroom. Yeah, definitely would like a pop top. And no, I, I think that's it, probably. I want a magic van that is like a TARDIS, so compact on the outside and bigger on the inside. And when they invent one of those, sign me up. Out of all the design decisions you made on the van, which ones make you think I did that and please you the most? Uh, probably the gas installation because gas terrifies me this we're talking propane here and that stuff i mean it's hellish dangerous really a bottle of hugely compressed propane that could spew out and kill you in a moment of a spark it's terrifying but i put the installation in and okay it only goes to a heater and a hob there was a certain amount of crimping the metal crimps onto the metal pipes because the standard here in the UK is you have to have metal pipe work with copper crimps on the joints. You're not supposed to use flexible piping. I don't know the reason. It seems to me flexible piping would be better in a van, but, um, you know, it's bouncing around all the time. But anyway, whatever it is, the rule says that from the regulator onwards, you're supposed to use copper piping. And I did all that. And I had it certified. In fact, I had it pressure tested once and then fully certified as OK. And it, and it passed. And I was so pleased with myself because it is terrifying. But the fact that it got certified and all fine, that made me very pleased. Um, so, yeah, that, that pleased me the most, I think. How have the windows worked out? I thought it was wild that you could just glue them on. I think most modern windscreens are just glued in place, aren't they? So in theory it should be fairly normal to just glue them on. I was very concerned when I did it, but I read the instructions so thoroughly and again and again and made sure that I absolutely followed them to the letter in terms of cleaning the metal, cleaning the glass, applying the primer exactly as they say, and above all, when applying the really sticky glue, and by golly, this stuff is sticky. If you get it on anything, you won't get it off for weeks. But the trick, if you're going to glue your own windows in, is to make sure you apply the glue at 90 degrees to the metal. So if that's the metal and this is the glue dispenser, it's like that. You don't do it like you would do a line of beading um, around a bath where you kind of, you, you put it at an angle, don't you? And you go along like that. You, you hold it at 90 degrees with a V-shaped cut on the plastic nozzle. So you get this big triangle of goo, gooey glue, sticking directly out from the van. And that way, when you put the window on, it definitely makes contact all around. And I'm guessing this is the mistake people make when they try it and they leak. And they've held the glue dispenser, not at 90 degrees, but more like a sort of 30 degree, like you would when doing a bath sealant. And you just don't get that big blob of glue around the edges. Um, so they've worked out very well, no leaks. Um, no, they're, they're fine and they're still in. So I'm, I'm quite pleased with those. And, you know, I was going to time this so I could see how long I'd been nattering for, but I, I have a feel, feeling, oh, it's telling me 36 minutes already. Look, I'm going to have to bring this video to a halt. Um, and there's still more than half of the questions left. So we'll just do this final one. Have you been happy with your insulation, particularly the underfloor insulation? I'm about to sneeze. <laughs> Pardon me. A little bit of hay fever, I think. 
are you happy with the insulation, the underfloor insulation? Also, is the Reflectix you use spray glued on or just taped? I'll answer the last one. It was glued on. I'm pretty sure I sprayed, then glued, and I taped over any gaps in it with the foil tape. Am I happy with the insulation? Yes. I mean, it's hard to know because you'd have to do a direct comparison van with no insulation, van with insulation, to know whether it really made any difference. But uh, as far as I can tell, it's fine. I haven't. I have camped in the van in winter, early days when I got it, and I would put the heater on, sure. But once I was in my sleeping bag, which is what I was using at the time, I was perfectly warm enough. And as for the underfloor insulation, well, if you go back to that video where I was doing that, I didn't really put any underfloor insulation in because I've got so little headroom, I couldn't afford to lose another inch to the floor. So all I've got is an air gap, which is actually quite a good insulator. Air is quite a good insulator if you have a gap. And then the reflective foil that bounces back any infrared radiant heat back upwards. But I haven't got slabs of insulating foam or anything under there because I couldn't afford to lose the headroom. And um, I don't find it to be a problem. I have put carpet down in the van, which is really so that my feet are more comfortable um, and feel a little less cold when they're on the floor and with that it's absolutely fine so yeah quite happy anyway look it's now 38 minutes of me just waffling on um, so I think we'll have to call it to a halt there as I say that's that's barely half of the questions this is, I don't really know what to do um, I'll have to trim them down or something. But thank you to everyone who's contributed a question to this half of the Q&A. I will record the other half, which includes topics such as what improvements would I make, looking to the future, logistics of the van and the boat. A lot of people asking about logistics of the van and the boat. Um, stuff about filming, more stuff about van and the boat, some general questions, and then one or two somewhat bizarre questions as well. We'll have to do those in part two of the Q&A. So if you have watched to this point, blimey, your tea will be getting cold by now. Hope it was vaguely interesting and useful and hope you'll join me again in part two. Cheers for now. Bye bye.